Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. And today, our topic is Israel and the Middle East, the current situation there. Uh, as we are taping this, we have been through a little over a month of direct conflict in the Middle East, uh, triggered by the kidnapping of three Israelis and uh, really the murder of those three, and then uh, in a reprisal, a kidnapping of a Palestinian who also died that has led to this latest conflict. And there really is a context for what's going on here. When these things happen, they don't happen in isolation. So I've brought together three people with background and experience, not just in thinking about Israel and the Middle East, but all also uh, having spent time in Israel, significant time in Israel, and so we just want to discuss kind of the background and situation with them. My guests are uh, David Brickner, who is president of Jews for Jesus, who is who is um, with us by Skype and is on vacation in the San Francisco area, and Mitch Glazer, who is president and CEO of Chosen People Ministries. He's the other Skype. Uh, person that you see, I was going to describe them by their beards, but they both have beards, so if you want to distinguish them, what's the best way to say this? Um, Mitch is the more mature of the two that you're looking at. And then, uh, uh, and then, uh, Jim. I would, I would say it's because I'm wearing glasses. Is yeah. that what it is? Well, that'll work. There you go. So there, there are multiple ways to distinguish the two personalities that we have uh, by Skype. And then with me in studio is Jim Sibley, who has spent years as director of the Jewish Studies Program at Criswell College and is an adjunct professor at Southwestern and, and Criswell as well. So they all have have extensive experience in being involved with uh, and, and having an awareness of what's going on in Israel. Uh, and of course, I'm Darrell Bach, Executive Director of Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center here at Dallas Theological Seminary. So we welcome you for being a part of the podcast today. Well, gentlemen, as is often the case, the Mideast is uh, boiling, uh, and we're going through a sequence in which we've had um, uh, uh, events that have triggered uh, violence and conflict and rockets going back and forth. We've had ceasefires and violation of ceasefires. It's a pretty chaotic uh, situation that we see. Um, Mitch, I'll start with you. Um, in your mind, how did we get to where we are? <laughs> well, it <clears throat> it's probably started with the Holocaust, Daryl. And, I mean, you can go all the way back to Abram and to Genesis 12 and the promise of the land to the Jewish people, but I think the current conflict was really born out of the Holocaust where God was faithful to the Jewish people, didn't allow the Jewish people to be destroyed, although so many were killed. And uh, sort of the sympathies of the world were turned towards those who remained after the Holocaust, and um, uh, somehow the between the Ottomans, the British, and the, U the fledgling UN, uh, the uh, United States uh, was very supportive as well. Israel was given uh, uh, back their historic uh, land, and uh, then Israel started settling that land, although there were plenty of Jewish people there beforehand. But um, this was a, a land now really settled by those who had survived, who needed a country where they could be safe, and, uh, and so there were uh, some uh, people there who uh, were Bedouins and uh, Arabs, it was all part of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire, and, uh, you know, you had the Jewish people moving in, there was plenty of land for everybody, and uh, instead of just going along with what uh, the fledgling uh, United Nations had really established. Uh, you basically had uh, a fight over land, and that fight over land has continued uh, ever since. And I don't think until everybody agrees to uh, live with each other in peace, until it's recognized that historically and even legally that this is a Jewish country, but room, there's room for everybody else. I think that there's going to continue to be hostilities. And I just, we've had, you know, three or four major wars, depending on how you count them, maybe even five. 
and uh, you continue to have internal strife. And I think that that's how we got to where we are. Much more complicated, but basically it's a dispute over land. Yeah, and we'll be talking about uh, the language that's used to describe what's going on here and how that even – even the way you talk about this ends up being uh, – uh, and raising issues. Uh, David, what's your take on how we got where we are? Well, Daryl, in your question, you used the word to describe the current situation as boiling, and I thought that was very biblical of you because, of course, we know that in Zechariah 12 and verse 3, God promises that in the last days he's going to make Jerusalem a heavy stone and a boiling pot of the nations. And we see that in reality today. And I think it's important for Christians to understand, like Mitch was saying, that all of this comes in not just in historical context, but in a biblical framework. And, uh, you know, Christians often have a depth of theological understanding regarding Israel in the past. Many are also very keenly interested in what the Bible has to say about Israel in the future. Unfortunately, it seems that when it comes to present-day Israel, biblical thinking takes a back seat to political expedience. And so Christians who look at what's going on in the Middle East today through a CNN worldview are going to have a failed perspective. We need to, to understand that the Bible gives us a framework for understanding the conflict. And as Mitch pointed out, uh, God promised the land to Israel long ago. And since then, as the scriptures say, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel has been at the nexus of the cosmic conflict between God and Satan. And God has made promises to the Jewish people. He intends to keep them. Satan wants to make God a liar and his minions are trying to follow through on that. The church needs to stand with Israel right now and recognize that God is simply fulfilling the promises of his word, and we are alive to see it today. Well, what, what, I'm going to come back in a minute and, and ask this question. You can be mulling it over. I'm going to turn to Jim here in a second and get his input on the first question. But the question I want to deal with is people can understand biblically the connection to Israel because she's so prominent in the Old Testament, and they can understand the idea of thinking about Israel in the future because she also is prominent in the way Scripture talks about the last things. The reason people deal with Israel in its current state is because of, uh, of what I would say some people have an uncertainty about how to view the current state of Israel. So we're going to come back to that question. It's an important one that you've raised, David. Uh, Jim, uh, what's your take on how we got to where we are? Well, I think it really goes back earlier than the Holocaust. I think it goes back to the uh, Zionist movement in the late 1800s. Uh, that's when the Jewish National Fund began purchasing uh, land. Other organizations also were purchasing land in Israel at that time. Um, settlers were coming in uh, prior to the, to the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, the Holocaust definitely added a tremendous impetus to the whole movement. But it actually began in the late 1800s with the uh, return of the Jewish people to the land. So what we're dealing with here, and I'm just trying to pull together what you all are saying, there's a biblical dimension, that's what David has, has raised. There is historical, and I would even say an emotional dimension of what the Holocaust contributed to the momentum of what was already going on in the Middle East, and then the roots of the, of the, of the practical situation we have in the land really comes as a result of the whole Zionist movement and the influx of Jews into the land. Uh, obviously predating the, the Holocaust, I mean, we, we haven't even mentioned the Balfour Declaration and things like that, uh, that, uh, that established a presence of Jews in the land, and then, and then we have this discussion, an ongoing discussion about whose land is it anyway, and, and what that is, is representative of. Uh, let's, uh, that, that's a good overview, and I, I think it's interesting that you each took a different tact on this, because part of what I'm hoping people see in our conversation is, is that there really are layers to this discussion. There are several things going on simultaneously that people have to be aware of as they talk about what's going on in the Middle East. Let, let's, let's come back to the, to the question that David's remarks raised, and that is there's, there's um, I don't know how to, how to say this, ambivalence, I don't know if that's the right word. There's, a, there's an uncertainty about how to talk about modern Israel. Um, we know that the, the Biblical Israel of the Old Testament, you know, is in the center of the biblical story. We 
many people believe that there is a future for a role of Israel coming back into the program and promise of God because of texts like Romans 9 to 11, etc. So they talk about Israel having reconnected to the Messiah in the future and being in the middle of the program of what God is going to do. That people, that is, those are categories people are used to. But what we often get is discussion about how in the world should we think about modern Israel. She's an unbelief. Uh, she doesn't believe in the Messiah as things stand right now. There's a remnant, certainly, of Messianics who do, but generally speaking, you know, the mass of Jewish people are not have not responded uh, to Jesus, and so and so that leaves an ambivalence towards the modern state of Israel and to, and to how to view Jewish people. So how do we walk into that into that scenario? And David, since you raised the question initially, I'm going to let you take the first crack at crack at it, but I'm going to come to all three of you on it. Yeah, I think that some of the uh, uh, previous support of Israel and the Jewish people that we witnessed among evangelicals in the certainly 60s and 70s when uh, Israel uh, recaptured Jerusalem um, <clears throat> has begun to be eroded by some of the key uh, theologians uh, in the world today. Uh, people like N.T. Wright and others have written, you know, specifically uh, concerning uh, Romans 9, 10, and 11, and while they, uh, you know, say that they're not uh, suggesting uh, replacement theology, uh, it, they end up in the same place. And so, because of their popularity, because that's what people are reading, uh, many people have started to waver on their understanding of what modern Israel has with regard to a claim to the land. I had a debate with John Piper about this where he said Israel has no divine right to the land. My counter was that Israel never had a divine right to the land. Israel always possessed the land by divine mercy. And uh, for much of the biblical record, Israel lived in the land while rebellious, breaking the Mosaic covenant, and yet God was merciful. He allowed Israel to remain in the land despite her unbelief. And he did this because of his gracious promise to Abraham and his descendants. Why could God not act in the same way today as he did back then? So the point is, is that there's a commitment that God has made to the people of Israel, and that is in place and, apl and uh, applies whether or not Israel is in faith or not. Is that, is that what you're suggesting? Not only that, but there are numerous places in the Scriptures, both Old and New Testament, where it seems to indicate that Israel will be back in the land in unbelief before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Uh, Zechariah 12, Ezekiel 37, even Romans 11. And so we have to recognize that it's not only a possibility, but it seems from the Scriptures to be part of the predictive plan. Okay. Mitch? Well, I would, I would agree with everything David said. Uh, I think that there's been a we have to take a, a, a careful look at the times in which we live. I think that uh, when I became a believer in, in 1970, uh, we were, I got saved with a copy of the New Testament in my right hand and a copy of the late great planet Earth in my left. And so there was a deep interest in prophecy, particularly after Israel became a state in 48 and then the recapturing of Jerusalem in 67. But then I think that there was a, a reaction. I think that, again, the luster of benevolence that was attached to the Holocaust began to wear thin. And uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, promotional agenda and narrative began sort of making its way into uh, the United States. And so we saw a reaction uh, to uh, Probably you saw it most in, in reaction to the Left Behind series and to an emphasis on prophecy. But I think it, it goes much deeper than this sort of knee-jerk reaction. Uh, I think that uh, there's been a growth, as David mentioned, to what I would call a neo-reformed uh, revival uh, in the United States, where a lot of our uh, great theologians uh, are from that background. And basically, they're either historic premillennialists to to an extreme, or they are uh, supersessionists or traditional amillennialists, and they would never take the, the Old Testament prophecies literally anyway. They would see the land promises fulfilled spiritually in the church. Therefore, there's no theological future to Israel in the land, whether it happened in 48 or whether it happens when Jesus comes back, yeah. or before Jesus comes back. And so, 
I, I think that we have to understand that that is the climate. Now, you add to this the tremendous interest of our younger generation in social justice. And, I mean, you know, at one time, the Jewish people were weak and, and uh, despondent and almost uh, destroyed. And so they were the they were the objects of Christian sympathy, whereas today the Palestinian plight is much more uh, dominant than the Jewish people who have a country and a military and everything else. And so the heart and the sympathies, the emotions, as you mentioned, Daryl, have been extended towards the uh, Palestinian uh, narrative. And so I think that just gives sort of a, a, a social, sort of sociological setting to this. I also want to just affirm what David said. And uh, I, I, I'm asked all the time whether or not I believe modern Israel is the fulfillment of prophecy. And I would, I would always say yes. And then people would say, so you believe that the modern state of Israel is, uh, is, is God's established kingdom? And I would say, well, hardly. Uh, <laughs> all you have to do is take one tour to Israel, and you know that's not true. And so Israel is a very secular country. The reason I say this is that, uh, number one, I do believe, according to Ezekiel 36, Verses 25 and, and following, and so on. That that before the dry bones are 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 made alive, they need to be resident in Israel. And so in 37, and so you do have Israel coming back in unbelief, and so that would be the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, whether or not the Jewish people are moved out again, there I can. I once tried to figure out how many LL planes it would take to move out six and a half to seven million people. It would take, it would be a major operation, needless to say. But let's say that this is not the absolute final. Uh, it's, it, it is one stage in the fulfillment of prophecy. But then again, if you're dealing with people who are really not interested in prophecy, who are spiritualizing and allegorizing the scriptures, and the land being, uh, uh, you know, being the blessings enjoyed by the church, then the truth is, Israel never gets back to the land. So prophecy, in that sense, is never fulfilled, because it's not literal. In fact, it was a non-literal prophecy that's been spiritually fulfilled in the church, which is a position I just simply don't accept. Okay. Now, the, the passage that's also in the background, a New Testament passage is also in the background, and I've got to bring this up because it's in the Gospel of Luke, is, um, is a passage in Luke 13 in which Jesus says that the house of Israel is desolate until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So what we have in Scripture, and I think this is important for people to appreciate, are kind of two Two themes, um, the relationship of them to one another is is hard to pin down. One is the idea of yes, Israel's going to be back in the land. She's even going to be back in the land in unbelief, but. The real trigger for the end time events beyond that is associated with when Israel, when Israel as a ma in mass turns back to the Lord, and that's that's when uh, major triggers related to final events are going to take place. And I think keeping both of those in balance is an important part of this conversation. Jim, what what's your take on what we're talking about? Well, now in Luke thirteen, the house is the temple. No, I don't think Luke 13 is about the house being the temple. And when he says the house is desolate, it's not like John 2 or or the uh, or the uh, taking over the temple area. This is this is coming as Jesus is going to Jerusalem on his journey to Jerusalem, and as he moves towards Jerusalem, uh, he is declaring the the position of the nation as being under judgment until she responds, which is the background for Peter's appeal in Acts 3 that the nation needs to repent in order that the times of blessing for the nation may come. Well, that's – we'll, we'll okay. agree on – to disagree on that one. But uh, at least as far as the promise of the land, in the Abrahamic covenant, the promise to the fathers in Genesis, um, three things were promised, land, seed, and blessing. and for those who want to say that the land promise has been spiritualized or allegorized or whatever, then what about the promise of blessing to the nations, to all the families of the earth, the blessings of salvation? I don't see how you can escape the conclusion that those also have been spiritualized, that they are not to be taken uh, literally. Uh, under the Mosaic Covenant, 
uh, enjoyment of the land was conditioned on obedience or whatever, but the promise of the land was still unconditional and irrevocable. Now under the New Covenant, we have the prophecy of Ezekiel 36 and 37 that the people will be brought back in unbelief. To hold them to the same standards as under the Mosaic Covenant, I think biblically doesn't really work. Although the modern state of Israel is committed to uh, uh, Western and Judeo-Christian values of uh, property rights and uh, the rights of individuals and uh, all of these kinds of things, um, nevertheless, those who want to try to hold Israel to the Mosaic standards uh, may have difficulty with consistency. What about general, profet, uh, general prophetic uh, calls to the core morality about how you treat foreigners and that kind of thing? Yeah, exactly. I think those are things that Israel has in place. Um, have there been abuses and uh, are there incidents of injustice? I think any, any, uh, any rational person would have to say yes, there have been on both sides. So, and this raises another question that comes up in this conversation that's an important one, and that is, in saying that Israel has the right to the land, and even saying that the modern state of Israel has a place somehow in the, in the biblical framework of displaying that God is being faithful to his promises, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that Israel gets a carte blanche on everything that she does in, in terms of dealing with the situation that she finds the land. I'm going to let you go first, Jim, on this one since you haven't had a chance to go first yet. So um, is, is that a, a fair way to summarize kind of where we are? Oh, absolutely. At the same time, I'm not sure that Israel needs to be held to a different standard uh, than those who oppose Israel. Um, for example, on the issue of civilian deaths in Gaza, when Gaza – when Hamas is firing missiles at Israeli citizens targeting Israeli civilians uh, deliberately – and repeatedly, and then uses civilians as human shields, it seems very strange then to criticize Israel for the deaths of those civilians which they have tried to avoid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that's uh, a point that's often uh, missed in the conversation. Mitch, your take on – does Israel get a carte blanche? Well, our, our country uh, just sent the Air Force to attack ISIS uh, militants in Iraq because, and the reason was allegedly humanitarian, which very well might be the case, in that the ISIS folks were doing things that were uh, evil and horrible to uh, citizens of Iraq. We reacted, responded militarily. Um, the fact that Hamas created um, uh, rocket launch centers in homes, in schools, uh, some sponsored by the UN. The fact that they had at least 30 or 40 tunnels that we know about, probably more, and that they all landed up in uh, a public institution, a mosque or a school or someone's home. Then for the U.S. or for Western nations, the U.S. has been the best, but for Western nations, to then judge Israel in some type of uh, moral equi equivalence debate that Israel is unfairly uh, uh, killing civilians, when th the truth is there's not, what's happening in Gaza with Hamas is the same as what's happening with ISIS. They float in the same stream. And what you have is a real problem with a value that extreme uh, Muslims uh, seem to have, and that is they do not regard human life right. at the same level that we do in the West, particularly those of us who have been influenced by Judeo-Christian uh, teaching. And until we recognize that, we'll never be able to understand that the moral equivalence dilemma should not even, in some ways, be discussed. Because if you had civilians killed, it's not because, it's not that the Israelis didn't make a mistake here and there. In war, there's always civilian casualties, we know that. But the reason why there might be quite a few of these, although not as many as claimed, 
is because of the actions of Hamas, not the actions of Israel. Right. So I think we need to really rethink the moral equivalence debate. And I think, I think it's also fair to say that, uh, that those who, um, who are making a point about how many children are killed, et cetera, know that there is in the West a sensitivity to these kinds of civilian deaths, even in the midst of using uh, people as human shields, as we're talking about. I'm very aware of stories of, of people uh, – uh, people on the Palestinian side seizing homes, launching rockets from homes from people who are completely innocent because they know the reprisal will come from where the rocket is launched, and they're actually trying to do two things at one time because oftentimes they'll march into a Christian home, a Palestinian Christian's home, and launch the rocket from that location in the hopes that the reprisal comes against that location and and uh, and. And, I mean, that is a form of human shielding as well. And, and so to do this in the midst of families, in the midst of homes, et cetera, and then to have the reprisal come and, and civilians and children die in the midst of it, they're well aware of, of what it is that the strategy is, is, is reaping. And people who aren't sensitive to that, I think, are missing part of what's going on. David, your thoughts on, uh, on yeah. this? Well, it's been said many times before, but the fact remains – that if the Palestinians laid down their arms tomorrow, there would be peace. If the Israelis laid down their arms tomorrow, there would be a bloodbath. And so we have to consider the source of these reports. There's no way that even with the best of talking points can stand up against the images of children and women in bloodied conditions in hospitals. But those reports and those images are being broadcast by a very successful uh, PR campaign that's designed to allow these human casualties in order to whip up not just anti-Israel sentiment around the world, but scratch that anti-Israel sentiment and very close to the surface you'll find the anti-Semitism yep. that has been roiling throughout Europe. Uh, Jewish uh, businesses being protested, boycotted, you know, that maybe these owners never have even set foot in the land of Israel. And yet now it's not just Israel in conflict with Gaza. It's Jews around the world who are being blamed by these uh, U.N. sponsored uh, media, uh, uh, you know, centers like CNN or, or British press or uh, particularly in Europe, not so much in America, but uh, it's, it's a tragedy that just goes to the, the very heart of what this conflict is, which is not just a political conflict, it's a spiritual conflict. And as, if we forget that as believers in Jesus, we're not going to have the biblical worldview and the framework to understand what's happening today. I think, I think one of the things that strikes me about what's going on is, 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 is how quickly, if I can say it that way, we have forgotten uh, – have forgotten the Holocaust and what it actually represented and what generated it. And, and I'm, I think we're coming to a point, and I'm thinking about this, I think we're coming to a point where we are losing the people who went through the, the Holocaust and for whom it is a historical reality. We now have a generation for whom it's just about something they saw on film or something like that. And as a result, we're losing the memory and the impact of what got us there to begin with. And you know, those who don't remember history are, 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 are prone to repeat it. And uh, I think we're seeing a little bit of that in what's going on today. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Join us next week for part two. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.